Hi, everybody, and thanks for being here. I'm Kevin McVeigh, and I'm excited to have the opportunity to welcome you here today. First, let me express a special thanks to the English department for arranging and sponsoring today's event, as well as the welcome addition of the cookies, Eat Up, which are apparently in a nearby room, but not this room. More to come on that as it develops. Secondly, to all the Eastern Writers Guild officers, President Dakota Dillon, Vice President Seth McCulloch, Secretary Rachel Scrivano, and Treasurer Rebecca Rubin, and the membership for their hard work sponsoring events like this and putting together Eastern student literary journal, Eastern Exposure, the next issue of which will be published next month. Thanks also to English Department Secretary Miranda Lau and the English Department student workers for creating and posting flyers to get the word out and to Media Services for being here to video record this event. Last but not least, all of you took the time to join us. Please feel free and encouraged to stick around afterward, talk, have a snack, purchase a book, thanks to the bookstore for being here to help out with that, and feel doubly encouraged to request a signature. And I mean be like really adamant about requesting that signature. That said, it is my pleasure to introduce, or maybe more truthfully reintroduce, Chris Tarakio. Chris holds a BA from John Carroll University, an MFA from the University of Pittsburgh, and a PhD from Western Michigan University. Here at Eastern, he has achieved the rank of full professor and has been awarded both the Eastern Excellence Award in Creative Activity and the CSU Tr Tr Trustees Teaching Award, tried to say that three times fast, in 2010 and 11, respectively. His work, in addition to being published in collections and novels, has appeared in Plowshares, the Gettysburg Review, the Antioch Review, the Iowa Review, and many other publications. He is the recipient of numerous grants and fellowships, including the University of Iowa Writers Workshop Fellowship, the Vermont Studio Center Fellowship, and the Wesleyan Writers Conference Teaching Fellowship. He has been awarded, nominated for, or received special mention for more writing awards than you can count on both hands, and certainly more than I can list in the time we have allotted. Perhaps even more telling is the response his work generates. Chuck Kinder calls Chris a young genius at the forefront of his generation, and his writing thoughtful, insightful, realistic, with grace and style. Turning to his latest offering, The Soul Hunters, Tim Parrish notes him as a master of structure, character, plot, and point of view, and he employs them all in the service of wisdom, maturity, and rich storytelling. While Richard Bausch claims, the Soul Hunters took me entirely out of my life and then very artfully led me back into it. One lives in this book. One sense of felt life is enhanced without quite seeing how it is brought off. A magic show, the first, the thing first-rate fiction always provides. For those of us who have had the pleasure in, of studying or writing with Chris, that last line probably conjures up an oft-repeated refrain that to write fiction is to engage the reader in a vivid and continuous dream. I have had the pleasure of studying fiction, workshopping it, and producing it with Chris, and even peering a bit behind the curtain as a TA and witness to some small part of his creation of The Soul Hunters with other senior students as we fought our way tooth and claw through our own first novels. And I can say with firsthand experience that the words that come to mind are indeed thoughtful, insightful, and infinitely patient. He has a grasp of the emotions, psychology, and heart, the humanness, if you will, that makes his characters feel touchingly real in that vivid and continuous dream, and performs a sort of magic that transmutes a classroom into a conversation that improves the writing of everyone involved. There are two kinds of experts in the world, those that remain on top by pushing others down, and those that encourage others by pulling them upward, saying, come up here, you've got to see this. Chris is the latter. Please join me in welcoming Professor Chris Taracchio. Wow, that's, uh, yeah, that's, that's the best introduction I've ever got. Uh, thank you so much. It doesn't, does not surprise me. It's, it's not going to be too long before uh, we're all meeting back here for Kevin to read from his first novel. It's coming very, very soon. Um, thank you for that, Kevin. Thank you. to. I want to echo the thanks that, that, that Kevin gave out at the beginning, the English department, the Writers Guild, um, all of you here. I see some colleagues. That was very nice of you to come. And students, I know some of you are getting extra credit for being here. Um, not from me, from other people. My students 
I, I see you. We'll, we'll <laughs> figure something out. Um, but thank you very much. So and it's nice to have so many people here to hear me talk about my little my little book, um, which uh, I guess I should say a little something about before I read read from it. Um, as Kevin said, it's called the Soul Hunters, and um, it, uh, it 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 focuses on three brothers, um, late middle age, fifties brothers who have just lost their father, and and the 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 story takes place on the evening following the funeral of their father, and um, it's a really I mean, tough time for all of them because their mother has already passed, and so they've they've sold the house. They're basically moving everything out. The the, the novel opens with a brief scene of of the yard sale where they're basically selling their their parents' possessions, and it's um, a story of of these people, the three brothers and their three wives who are there also, of really just kind of tidying up this part of their life before moving on because they all, all three of them live out of town, probably will never be back here again. And um, it's, so it's, it's, it's a time that they're reflecting on, but it's also difficult for them because they're, you know, they're, they're trying to move on as well. And they have a lot of baggage amongst each other, um, still left in that house and then stuff that they have to kind of deal with as, as they move on. Um, so and and it, it bounces around each each um, chapter is a different narrator between the three brothers and and their wives, and I'm going to read from a, a chapter toward the beginning um, from the point of view of Lawrence. He's the oldest brother, and just a couple of things that I, I don't think there's too much context that I have to set. Um, but you know, it, it, Lawrence is the oldest brother. His wife is Selena. Um, the brothers are Nick and Stuart, and their wives, Abigail and um, uh, Sydney. Raymond is mentioned. Um, he's a cousin. <laughs> um, Carmelo is the father who has passed. He's, he appears in a flashback. His wife is Anne. That's the mother. And the other, only other thing I should probably mention is this takes place about 10 years ago. So if there's any reference to like the president or anything like that, it's not this president. It's the previous president. Um, and I already, I already apologize to Eliza for the language. There's gonna, there's some language. She, she's okay with it. Though. Yeah, okay. Um, so here we go. I should probably also say. <laughs> Well, one of the things that was tough about writing this book is it is, you know, uh, sort of kind of based on personal experience in the sense of it, it, it's kind of, I, I watched my parents kind of go through this. The, the idea started from my grandfather's funeral and, and what that, the generation ahead of me had to go through, you know, and kind of putting all that behind them. And what was particularly tough is, it, you know, Trying to base these characters on my own family um, was was difficult. I usually don't do that. I mean, those of you who are in my class know that I'd much rather make it up than than you know deal with my own life in any way. Um, so uh, you know, as I was writing it, it was kind of tough to kind of try to put myself in the perspective of aunts and uncles, and I felt pretty bad about it though too because. Who knows what your aunts, your uncles, your cousins you know, are, are really thinking about on the inside, what their inner life is like. And like I said, I do like to make things up, so I, I felt bad. I mean, I, I gave my uncle prostate cancer. I, uh, I made my aunt kind of a you know, stuff like that. And so hopefully they're okay with that um, when they see themselves or, or who they correspond to in here. Um, but anyway. He stared down into the commode, waiting for something to happen. One more pause again. There's an example, commode. I've never used that word in my life. Have I used that word? That's what my wife says. I've never used that word in my life. Um, but my grandparents always used it. And so in, in writing about this, it just sort of seeped in there, especially when you know, I was trying to imagine their house and things like that. He stared down into the commode, waiting for something to happen. He'd been doing a lot of that lately, staring into various toilet bowls as time passed around him. This one was white porcelain, low water level ringed with a thin layer of dark grime. Lawrence knew it well, was there when his father installed it, listened while his parents fought over the door that would conceal it. 
His mother wanted a regular wooden door with a knob that swung open and closed and could be locked if necessary, like doors possessed by civilized human beings. But his father countered that there wasn't enough room at the end of the tiny hallway onto which the new bathroom would be added and insisted on a flimsy closet-style door that folded open like an accordion. She'd renew the argument periodically for the rest of her life. You can hear everything through that lousy door. It's like you're going to the bathroom right in the kitchen. Lawrence took a breath and let his head drop back. Near the ceiling, the wallpaper border, mixed fruit chosen by his mother, was cracked and peeling. There was a faint smell of Listerine and mothballs. He thought he felt something happening at the base of his torso, but it was a false alarm. He shifted his weight to his other foot. It could be a while yet. Oftentimes, that was the case. Oh, bull he heard Nick's voice from the kitchen. What, would he, what, what should he have done? Tell me that. You want to be attacked again? Huh? Do you? And Raymond's feeb feeble, mumbled, unintelligible response. Lawrence didn't want to partake in any of this, didn't want to hear his brother's practiced news, uh, Fox Newsy rationale as to why the current war was good and the president was on the right track, even if the goddamn li liberals were trying to cut his legs out from under him. Lawrence had no idea where any of this came from. His brother was a good man, ge generous, kind-hearted, smart. Arguing, arguing with him about these matters made Lawrence feel small and weak, made him question his own values and beliefs. So he'd keep them to himself and just let Nick go on and on and on. Then, once they'd parted, Lawrence would lie in bed berating himself for not defending more aggressively what was in his heart. Well, then what would you have done, Nick demanded of Ray, his customary refrain, if you liberals have all the answers? The last time Lawrence and Selena visited, he'd sat at the table with Nick late at night, poking with plastic forks at slices of store-bought cheesecake. Selena and Abigail were in the dining room, talking, killing time. Stu and Sidney had already left. Who knew where Dad was? Puttering around in the basement, sleeping in the recliner in the living room. They were talking about their kids, then about housing prices in their respective towns, and as usual, Nick tied these topics to politics, to taxes. Didn't his brother understand that his salary, his livelihood, depended on taxes? Then to the war. He pushed some chunks of pie crust around on his plate. Then he said, you know, if I were a little younger, I'd enlist. I would. I still might, seriously. I mean, what the hell? I can drive a truck, right? I can unload boxes. I can... I can mop up. They must need some things done, done over there that a healthy 56-year-old man can help out with. Lawrence was about to let out a chuckle to tell Nick good-naturedly to get the hell out of here. But when Nick looked up from his plate, Lawrence saw immediately that his brother wasn't joking. You would think was all Lawrence could manage. It was a brief, tender respite from the veiled accusations of naivete Nick typically hurled at Lawrence like screwballs, seemingly easy to swat back at him, yet time and again, Lawrence found himself flailing blindly. And when Nick began nodding, not in agreement, but as if Lawrence's inane statement simply confirmed Nick's expectations and allowed a press-lipped smile of pity to ease across his face, Lawrence felt about 10 years old. But Lawrence was not naive couldn't be, and the insinuation left him bristling. He'd lived, goddammit, he'd suffered. He knew what it meant to work for a living. He knew what it meant to put three daughters through college at a time when the number of Pell Grants was declining every year and interest rates for education loans were rising. He knew what it was like to get a $600 tax rebate check in the mail on one day and the very next receive word that as a result of these rebates, his salary would be reduced by 2.5%, as would the salaries of every other faculty member in the Wade Ridgefield School District. He knew what it was like to play it a little too close to the vest, to try and push through the rough patches as if nothing had changed, and wind up filing for bankruptcy at 50, something he'd never, something he'd never told his brother, the financial wizard. To look your wife in the eye and admit to each other that your lives hadn't gone the way you'd planned, that in fact they'd taken a terrible turn. He knew what it was like to stare at a bottle of Valium in the medicine cabinet and wonder what it would be like to swallow the whole goddamn thing. But he also knew what it was like to get past it. After the bankruptcy hearings, he had known what he had to do, knew that in order to get their life back, he had to work summers, two and three sessions each, advise the yearbook club, coach the lacrosse team, take on tutoring clients from other districts. And he did. They got their life back, avoided foreclosure, bought themselves a Saab 9-5 exactly like the one they'd lost, same color, same year. He knew never to get too comfortable. 
Once his and Selena's life appeared to be back on track, he knew the numbing anger of discovering that his youngest daughter's boyfriend had been hitting her, knew the fear of confronting this boy on the front step of his apartment, of threatening the boy's life and meaning it. And Lawrence knew how to keep a secret, like the one he was keeping now. He closed his eyes, tried to relax, to block out the sound of his brother's rehearsed rationale. He took a breath, opened his eyes. On the back of the toilet tank was a magazine turned upside down. The back cover featured a full page ad for Copenhagen snuff. Lawrence reached out, re retaining his position in front of the bowl in case any development should suddenly occur, and flipped the magazine over. It was an, Amer it was an American sportsman, December 1998, the year their mother had died. Most likely their father never renewed the subscription afterwards. On the cover was a smiling man in camouflage kneeling over a felled buck, his hand gripped around the antlers, lifting the deer's wobbly head off the ground. Weaving around the buck's antlers was a string of illuminated green, red, and white Christmas lights. Some of the stories inside included, Why You Miss Ducks, Gun Dog Training Resolutions for 99, Beginner Tips for Coyote Hunting, Catch Cold Water Bass on Sprinkler Baits, I'm sorry, spinner baits. The truth about Kentucky's whitetail population. And what appeared to be the holiday feature, deer hunting is good for the soul. Lawrence wondered what the truth about Kentucky's whitetail white population could possibly be, but not enough to open the magazine to find out. Probably it depended on who you asked. One truth that never could be challenged was which brother had tried the hardest to follow in their father's footsteps as a hunter. Stu was useless in the woods, never even bothered to fake an interest. Nick, who admittedly was the most accurate shot of the brothers and therefore received the most marksmanship-related praise from their father, went on two deer hunting trips, maybe three, before beginning to come up with fake excuses. But Lawrence, though technically not as good a shot as Nick, stuck it out the longest, tagging along with his dad and his buddies, learning the best spots, the ins and outs of tracking, when to be patient, when to fire, where to aim for the kill shot. He took no pleasure in any of it, but he was the oldest, and he was willing to make sacrifices if it meant achieving a level of his father's approval beyond what Nick enjoyed. Lawrence recalled clearly the day he stopped trying. He was 16, a Sunday afternoon, autumn. That summer, Duquesne Light had begun clearing a section of wooded area across State Route 33 from their house for the construction of a remote transporter station. Only a half dozen or so trees had been cut down and hauled away by this point, but there was one particular stump, its wide, flat surface about three feet off the ground, on which their father and his buddy Cal had taken to placing random items, old milk jugs, coffee cans, spent oil filters, for target practices. They'd stand, on, they'd stand in the side yard between the house and garden on the slight incline along State Route 33 and fire across the street. Illegal? most likely. Monitored? Never. But 33 was rarely traveled, and Carmelo and Cal, whether drunk or sober, usually were careful to check for cars before sighting their weapons. After a while, adjustments and modifications were made to the activity. Cal wanted more of a challenge, so he began, try began tying a three-foot length rope, I'm sorry, a three-foot length of fishing line to the low branch of a half-felled oak and hanging items from it. The target would swing casually in the breeze, thereby increasing the level of difficulty. Cal had been their father's tightest companion for as long as Lawrence could remember. He was short and beefy with a completely shaved head, and he, had, and he emitted a faint but constant aroma of stuffed cabbage. Cal never married, and as they grew older, particularly after Anne passed, he and Carmelo took to, be, took to bickering like an old married couple. Recently, Cal had gone through chemo half a dozen times, had his spleen, a kidney, an eye, and parts of a lung removed, but competitor, but competitor that he was, he showed up at their father's funeral in a bathrobe and an eye patch, dragging an oxygen tank on wheels behind him. His scalp looked like the plucked skin of a raw chicken. Back in the day, though, his competitiveness could be insufferable. He was a bit of an exaggerator, too. One of those guys who, if you happen to mention the pesky splinter in your thumb, would snort and tell you that wasn't nothing, that he once nearly had his arm lopped clean off by a rogue pine shaving while trying to clamp his enormous Christmas tree into its base. And once, at a Fourth of July picnic, he cornered Lawrence off to the side of the charcoal grill and explained to him that a human being farts an average of 14 times a day, but that he, Cal, operated on a level that was way above that average, sometimes pushing his daily output into the triple digits. 
There was an edge in his voice that seemed to add, so if you're harboring any delusions of someday topping my performance, just forget about that right now, little man, because it can't be done. Carmelo wasn't one to back down from a challenge either, real or manufactured, and though the target practice sessions typically were impromptu, starting with just a quick couple of rounds for the hell of it, without, fa without fail, things would turn into marathons and grow borderline belligerent. The target, whether placed on the stump or hanging from the branch, was 150 or so feet away. From that distance, of course, rifles were the firearm of choice. No scopes were allowed, but they made things interesting by continually reducing the size of the target. Cal once took aim at a shot glass, fired, and though the glass did not move, did not have a mark on it, Cal claimed that he skimmed the side so delicately, kissed it almost, that the glass spun 90 degrees on the stump, which was exactly what he was trying to do. Look, he demanded, I, I, I put it here with the wolf head picture facing right at us. Now look, it's facing the whole other way. I spun the f right around. Your ass you did, Carmelo said. My ass, my ass, then you explain it, wise guy. Well, Christ, how the hell do I know what direction the goddamn picture was facing? I didn't see you put it there. I was way the hell over here, and I wouldn't give a fat holy shit if I had seen you put it there. Well, I did put it there. Then why didn't you say so beforehand, dip? Hey, watch this. I'm going to kiss the side and spin it around. All you had to say. But oh no, not you. You got to be all secretive. What the goddamn ass sense does that make? That was all part of it, Cal explained, a roguish grin snaking across his face now. A part of what? Jesus. Okay, fine, whatever. You spun, you spun it right around. Why it fucking erp over here? You didn't hear that plink sound when the bullet nicked the glass? Oh, right, right, the plink sound. Carmelo smacked the heel of his hand to his forehead. Sorry, my mistake. The hell was I thinking? Cal shrugged. Should have been paying better attention. Missed the shot of a lifetime. Horseshit of a lifetime is more like it, Carmelo said. Cal saved his most absurd excuses for whenever one of Carmelo's boys managed to show him up. Picking off a flashlight battery that Cal clearly had missed. Goddamn, that flew right in my eyeball. Answering Cal's feat of plugging an old baby doll with a gut shot by blowing its head clean off. Well, yeah, but that ain't the proper place to aim at a human. Usually the culprit was Nick, which Lawrence found maddening. So on that autumn Sunday afternoon, 1964, Nick came to Lawrence with a plan. The objective was a practical joke of sorts played on Cal and their father. As the two men stood bickering in the side yard along, uh, uh, side yard along State Route 33, Lawrence walked out of the house carrying the Colt 32 revolver and a box of 40-watt light bulbs. Cal fired off a shot that sent bits of the stump flying. Then he and Carmelo turned to see Lawrence approaching. Go put that thing away before you shoot your leg off, Carmelo said. Lawrence paused. There was a moment when he considered doing what he'd been told. Then he regained his pace. I won't, he told his father. I want to show you something. Been working on it. Working on what? Just watch. He stutter stepped down the little incline and crossed the road. When he reached the stump, he placed the revolver there, then took a light bulb from the box and began tying the end of fishing line around the bulb's neck. As he did this, according to the plan, Nick should have been removing a deer rifle and box of shells along with their father's best scope from the cabinet. He then would have to maneuver past their mother and make his way upstairs, where he would crawl quietly out their parents' bedroom window and onto the roof of the back porch. Lawrence struggled with the knot. His hands were shaking for some reason. Are those, gold, are those good bulbs, his father called? We need those. But Lawrence kept on. About 12 inches above the bulb, he tied a second, then began tying a third above that, like a string of fish. He had, a stand on the, he had to stand on the stump for the highest bulb. The hell's he doing, he could hear Cal asking, and his father saying, hanging light bulbs, apparently. Jesus, Cal, how the hell should I know? When he was finished, he picked up the colt and headed back across the road. As discreetly as he could, he glanced upward and spotted part of Nick's face and the top of his head. He was lying flat on his stomach, butt of the rifle pressed to his shoulder, sighting the string of light bulbs through the scope. Something on your mind, his father asked Lawrence once he descended from the road to where the men stood. Just watch, he said, and snapped open the cult cylinder. He dug three bullets from his jeans pocket and pushed them one at a time into the chambers. Whoa, boy, said Cal, a slight whine in his voice. Just ho hold on there. He turned and appealed to Lawrence's father. 
Mel, I mean, come on, what's he... Come on. Shut up, Cal, said Carmelo. He spit into the grass. So what you planning to do, son? Lawrence snapped shut the cylinder. Shoot out those targets I just hung there. Mel, said Cal. Mel, this is... He turned and began pacing around in the lawn in a tight... Pacing around the lawn in a tight circle. Son, Lawrence's father said calmly, you can't hit a target like that from this distance with a handgun. You just can't. No one can. I can, said Lawrence. You want to shoot, his father said. That's fine. Here, try the twenty-two. He handed a rifle to Lawrence. But Lawrence raised the Colt with his right hand, let his left hand, let his left hang casually at his side. He steadied the gun, closed his left eye, and sighted down the barrel. In the distance, he could see the string of light bulbs hanging perfectly still in the breezeless air. On the stump was the empty box. He'd for, uh, was the empty box. He'd forgotten it there. A prematurely orange leaf drifted down through his field of vision. Cal made an odd, strangled noise. What's he? One, Lawrence said loudly. Two, three. He squeezed the trigger. Lawrence ar Lawrence's arm snapped upwards violently, and across the road, the bottom light bulb exploded. It all happened so fast, Lawrence had to blink the world back to life. Only then did he realize how loud the gunshot had been. He could still hear it echoing beyond the house and over the trees. His hand and wrist vibrated. Holy, Cal began. Carmelo stepped forward and squinted at the string of what now was two light bulbs. Then he turned and regarded Lawrence. How did you do that, he asked. Lawrence swallowed. Just aimed and shot, he said. Can you do it again? Sure, Lawrence said. Maybe. No way, said Cal. Nobody gets that lucky twice. Go ahead, Carmelo said to Lawrence. There was a touch of encouragement in his voice that Lawrence had never heard before, at least directed toward him. Okay. Again, Lawrence raised the colt. Again, for the sake of authenticity, or perhaps just for the hell of it, he aimed at what he had been, he aimed at what had been the middle light bulb. One, two, three. He was ready for the kickback this time, and this allowed him to focus on the gunshot, which was as loud as a thunderclap and contained an infinitesimal second beat. Ba bang. The light bulb disappeared with a splash. Good God, Carmelo said after a moment. Son, that's amazing. Lawrence felt his throat close up a little bit. Why is he saying one, two, three, Cal wanted to know. The hell's that all about, huh? Carmelo scratched his bald spot. Why are you saying that? I just, Lawrence started. It struck him that he should have anticipated this question and prepared a credible response. Because, I don't know, because that's how I practiced. It gets me into a kind of a rhythm and sort of relaxes me. He waited a moment and then said simply, I don't really know why I do that. Cal sharpened his gaze at Lawrence. Do it again, but without the one, two, three. Lawrence felt his heart stumble and trip inside of him. I don't know, he said. I didn't practice. Oh, for shit's sake, Cal, his father said. You really care if the kid counts to three? Are you shitting me? For real? Aren't you the same guy who can't raise a bet without tapping his cards on his nuts first? Sheesh. He clapped Lawrence, he clapped Lawrence on the back. Go ahead, son. Get the last one. If you want to count, go right, go right ahead and count. Lawrence felt tears percolating inside him. His eyes burned. Something awful was about to happen, and he felt powerless to stop it. He raised the colt once more, quickly shouted, one, two, three, and fired. The shot rang out, and the last bulb shattered. The shot's echo crackled across the afternoon. Lawrence looked at his father, who was smiling, arms folded over his chest. Dad, Lawrence's voice cracked. His father turned to Cal, who was staring dumbly across the road. Any questions, dumb? Cal farted, reflexively. It had two pitches to it, low and guttural, and then an octave higher, like a foghorn in reverse. It went unacknowledged. Cal's lips moved, but no words came out. That's what I thought. Again, Lawrence's father clapped him on the back, kept his hand there this time. Dad. And that's when Nick giggled. Just a quick muffled bleat with a squeaky lilting tail at the end. Cal and Carmelo flinched and began glancing around them, arms held out as if groping for balance. Lawrence didn't look, but he could hear his brother scurrying across the shingles. He heard the rifle stock clatter against the window frame as Nick hurried back inside. What the, hey, 
Cal pointed up at the porch roof. He knew something was a foul. The wrinkled expression on his face said as much, yet he didn't know exactly what. He looked at Carmelo, who was still glancing upwards, blinking, allowing his mind to adjust to the events that had, that had transpired. The bedroom window was still wide open. The sheer curtains trailed outside. Mel, said Cal, I think... He considered his next words for a moment, then decided to just be honest. What just happened? Lawrence realized he was still aiming the revolver at the, fin at, at the fishing line across the road. He lowered the gun, but it felt awkward in his hand. Something deflated inside of him, and he held the gun out to his father, butt first. His father took it. Good one, he said. Tell your brother. Had me completely fooled. He chuckled, but it was forced, almost painful sounding. He held the colt in his palm and considered it. Yep, plum flummoxed. How about you, Cal? Cal was squinting across the road, sweat beaded on his bald head. It was clear he still didn't know what had happened. Huh? Never mind, I'll explain it all later. Suddenly, Lawrence had to go to the bathroom. Dad. It's all right, his father said. But it wasn't really. He didn't, at the time, know, uh, he, um, he didn't at the time know why it wasn't all right. He just knew it wasn't and never would be. But it occurred to him now, standing and waiting at the foot of the toilet bowl, that maybe he was naive and had been all along. Maybe this unacknowledged truth was, was at the root of all his problems. There seemed to be no relief forthcoming, and for the first time, Lawrence admitted to himself that he'd better see a doctor, that something most definitely was wrong, that he couldn't keep this condition a secret from Selena, from himself, any longer. He flipped the American sportsman back over and zipped up. He flushed, as he'd done on his last trip to the bathroom, for appearance's sake. The Colt's kickback had resulted in a sprained wrist for Lawrence, which he discovered the next day and tried to blame on slipping in the shower, which his father never came close to buying. And, a and, af and after that day, no son ever was invited on another hunting trip. Carmelo continued to go with buddies and later his buddy's sons. When he'd get a deer, he'd always give his boys and their families a good bit of the meat, which, at Lawrence and Selena's house, would sit in its white masking-taped butcher paper in the back of the freezer until it grew frosty with freezer burn, at which time it would all get thrown into the trash. Lawrence washed his hands with the cake of decade-old ivory soap and dried them on the pleats of his shorts. Then the pressure returned, rising from his knees, it seemed, and he spun around, unzipping, ready to resume his vigil. All right, thanks. Thank you. What do we want to do? Do we want to have cookies? Do we want to, does anyone have there any? There are cookies, uh, and they won't get any staler if we have a couple uh, While Chris is up there, anybody have any questions about the novel, about writing, about, about anything? About also, anything? I'll let you know that books are for sale, so after this, if you want to get a book signed, if you have one, or if you want to buy one, I'm sure he'll sign it for you. I would be happy to. Any questions? Any questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, you say you try not to be no, I've never been hunting, um, but I've heard stories of, uh, I mean, a lot of what, I, I mean, I made a lot of it up, but a lot of the basis for that aspect was sort of passed down to me from my father. He, you know, was sort of forced on a couple of hunting trips that he didn't want to go on, and uh um, that's where that that's where that came from. But by, by the time I came around, he had no interest in it anymore. So, yes. Oh sure, yeah. <laughs> hey Steve. I, I know you you said at the start that, that you were nervous or, or unsure about the conversation you were going to have when you were on. Yeah yeah. I guess you gave prostate cancer. Have you mm -hmm. had any of those? What's that? Have you had any of those conversations? No, like, it's weird. People, you know, um, they don't want to talk about it. Yeah, um, you know, um, it, you know where I where I I've gotten it from my cousin. I, I've you know some some you know questions about that, um, which would be my generation. You know about you know about that, and it's pretty clear. I mean, for them, it's pretty clear that I made a lot of it up. You know, but it's also pretty clear. If they wanted to insert themselves into the sort of 
family tree of this family. They can tell where they go, you know? Um, so, so far they've been pretty good at separating the two and realizing that it's, you know, it's this character and not them that has prostate cancer. <laughs> yes, sir. Have I been to Italy? Yeah, yeah I have. Yeah, we had, well, uh, several of the. Oh, you're talking about the yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so you're talking about a different chapter. Yeah, that it's weird. Um, um, we, we, a lot of these students know I, I go to Italy every summer and 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 bring these students along. Some of them are coming this year. Some were there last year, the year before, um, and we always go to Florence. And what's weird is the scene that you're talking about takes place in Verona, which I've been to a grand total of one afternoon. You know, um, so it's weird where, you know, that kind of inspiration comes from. You know, why didn't I pick a place I was much more familiar with? I don't know. You know, I think a lot of that has to do with in the back of my mind making sure that, you know, I, I I'm not talking about myself. It's not my life. It's not my experience. It's. Uh, you know, it's this character, so I try to separate it from my, you know, from my own as much as possible, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. You said a lot of all these characters are based on family. Are you in any of these characters? No, I'm not. No, not at all. Um, actually, that's not true, I guess. I mean, I'm always injecting a little bit of myself into probably every single one of them, you know, in, in a way. Um, you know, I think some of the... So, you know the the sort of thoughts that that Lawrence was going through with the whole, you know, um, conflict with his brother, with the whole you know feeling naive, you know stuff like that. Um, like I've never been through any of that stuff that Lawrence is describing, but I, you know, some of those feelings are what I would, you know, kind of perceive of myself if I were injected into that, um, into that situation. So. Yeah, I guess I'm in all of them, you know, in a way, but specifically none. Did that make any sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. How long did it take to write the book? How much research did you have to do? I don't do research. Oh. Um, <laughs> I don't, um, um, how long did it take me? Th I want to say three to four years, something like that. Yeah, um, all told. Um, Actually, that's not true uh, with the research. No, the three to four years is true. But with, um, I, I typically don't research. But what I, you know, and, and some of my students have, have heard me say this, you know, if, you're, if, if a character has a certain occupation or a certain expertise or interest, y you want that to be believable. So you have to, you have to know something about it. And sometimes that means kind of, "Quote unquote researching, you know, to find it out. But I always do my research, if that's even the word I would use, afterwards. I make it up first, <laughs> so it, it so it sounds the way I want it to sound. Then I'll kind of fact check it. You know, it, it, it is you know, like um, there's one character in the book for those of you who, who have read it. Um, Nick's wife can't have kids anymore because she had." Um, uh, ovarian cancer, and um, God, why is everybody getting cancer in this book? I don't remember. There would be that many. Um, and it's found early by accident, and so I had to come up with a way that it could be found by accident, by accident early. So I gave her a hernia, <laughs> and um, when they were checking for that, they found this other thing, and I didn't know if that was even possible, you know. Um, then it turns out it was, you know. But so I, I, I wanted it to sound believable in my own head first. Then I would, then I go back and research because I find that if you research first, at least I do, you have a tendency to sort of throw everything in that you've learned, and you don't want to do that. You only want the stuff that's necessary for, you know, for that moment, for that character, for that situation. And so I kind of make myself believe it first and give just enough background and detail that I need. To, you know, and then I'll go check it to see if I got any of it right. Make the changes if I need to. Anything else? Yes, ma'am. So each of the chapters does, um, I did read it, each of the chapters is from a different point of view. Mm -hmm. So, but they're not using first person. Right. Like saying I did this or something. So what's, what's the decision to do that? How do you think that, like, culture, like, what do you think about that? Well, my, my decision was, um, I'm already dealing with six 
narrators, is that what it is, six? Might even be more than that. Yeah, um, six narrators, which I'm all, uh, so right out of the gate, I'm asking the reader to, to do a lot, you know, to, to, to hang in there with six different narrators, you know, alternating. Um, and I thought, if I'm going to do it in first person, each with a different voice, that's a lot, you know, to, to, to ask. Um, plus, you know, and some of you who are, who are writers know this, you, you just kind of develop your own little methods and ways of doing things and little rules that you adhere to. And I've gotten to the point where I kind of always start in third person um, until the story tells me that it needs to be in first, if it needs to be in first. Um, and the reason I do that is because I find when I write in first person, I kind of tell too much. You know, um, like every I, okay, I'm in this character's head. I'm I'm using the I, you know, narrator. Um, she, he or she is telling his or her own story in his or her own words, and I have a tendency to just subconsciously throw every waking thought that the character has onto the page, and nobody wants to read that. It, you know, um, so I start with third person, which for me is kind of a built-in editor, so to speak. I'm, 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 I, I know, OK, here's what this character has to reveal in order for me to understand it. Um, so that's why I did it that way. Yeah. Anything else? No? Well, I can't thank you all enough for hanging in there with me.